Welcome into the Locked On Knicks podcast, Gavin Shaw, Alex Wolf. The Knicks wrapping up their West Coast road trip in not so ideal fashion, falling to the Portland Trail Blazers 112 to 103. Uh, we're going to talk about the game, but we also took some questions, Alex. Yeah, talk about ending the trip with a thud. Luckily, Quentin Grimes really showed out, and we took a couple questions from Twitter, one of which asks if RJ and Grimes should be the wing rotation of the future, which we will talk about in the first segment. Then we'll talk a little bit about how we would build out the rotations going forward and, and going into the future, what we would be looking for this offseason. Maybe even take a quick draft question that we're not quite prepared for. And then we'll end off just kind of with some housekeeping on this game, although the game was really miserable, quite frankly, and was was not a good time. So we're going to get into some of the things that we could learn from this game, including how Tibbs approached it. But that's all coming up next on Locked on Knicks. <laughs> You are Locked On Knicks, your daily New York Knicks podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. You are Locked On Knicks, and we wanted to thank you for making Locked On Knicks your first listen today and every day, in case you didn't know, and we assume you do, but if you didn't, uh, we are now on YouTube. We are thriving on YouTube, but... We continue to welcome newcomers. We're not, we're not shutting it down just yet. So please, 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 if you haven't yet, go and subscribe on YouTube. And today's episode is brought to you by Bet Online. Bet Online has you covered this season with more props, odds, and lines than ever before. Bet Online, where the game starts. And I am Gavin Shaw, a play by play broadcaster. He is Alex Wolf, editor in chief of the greatest Knicks website out there, The Strickland. Uh, they had some great uh trade deadline coverage and they have fantastic coverage of everything that happens with the Knicks so certainly go check them out as well and your New York Knicks uh fell 112 to 103 to the Portland Trail Blazers on Saturday night it was a game that the Knicks led 82 to 59 uh with about four and a half minutes or excuse me 455 left in the third quarter from that point forward Portland outscored them 53 to 21 so we are not going to start there Alex we are going to start with some mailbag questions, uh, you want to throw out the first one? Yeah, and it sort of it sort of plays into the uh, the game a little bit because I'm sure that we'll talk about how well Quentin Grimes played in this game in this first segment. So uh, our buddy Ignacio at Ignacio Lobregat on Twitter, uh, and I'm I'm going to just take the first part of Ignacio's question. We'll get to the second part in the second segment, but uh, Ignacio asks: Assuming our point guard issues get solved, whether by Brunson or by other means, as free agent draft uh, or Rokas Jokobitis, what's a more likely wing duo in the long term? RJ and Grimes or RJ and Quickly? Uh, the next part of Ignacio's question is talking about the rotation, but we're going to get into that in a minute. Uh, but Gavin, I think I mean this feels pretty easy to me at this point. If we're literally talking about the wing, you know, rotation or the wing duo going forward. I assume that Ignacio is talking about, you know, the shooting guard and small forward spots on the floor. I love Emmanuel quickly to death. I still believe in him. And I believe that, you know, he is still an impact player, even if his shot isn't going down as much lately, even if, you know, Tibbs feels that it's uh, the right move to take him out for a couple mistakes. I think that quickly's learning through his mistakes. I think he's doing a really good job. Um, the The big thing to me is just that, like, with quickly, I'm starting to really love the versatility that he gives you as sort of a, a combo, you know, that can play sort of point guard, but, you know, also uh, has some tendencies of a shooting guard. But I don't know if I would necessarily want him to be my starting shooting guard if the Knicks were able to get like a, a Jalen Brunson, because I think that, you know, if it's Brunson, let's say you're you're automatically, you know, he's mostly a one position defender. He can maybe slide to twos a little bit, but you mostly want him guarding point guards and anything other than that is probably a little bit of a mismatch because of his size, regardless of how tenacious he is on defense. With quickly, I know that he's got the the plus wingspan and all that stuff. He's still limited roughly, though, to about two positions. Like, I think he can guard ones and twos fairly credibly. And beyond that, you know, you start getting, think about it, threes, RJ Barrett is like a somewhat small three. If you had R.J. Barrett getting, you know, guarded by Emmanuel quickly, you'd feel like R.J. had a huge advantage there. And I'm sure that other teams would feel that way, too. Uh, so I, I think just positionally on both ends of the floor, I like the Grimes and R.J. duo. 
a lot better going forward. And, you know, I know that Evan Fournier is already sort of entrenched, at least for the next year or so. Probably is that starter at the shooting guard spot. But I think the Knicks have to be watching games like like this past game uh, featuring Grimes and just like salivating at the idea of like, yo, like sooner than later, we could have this guy and RJ Barrett both out there, like both being 40% three point shooters, both being able to put the ball on the floor, some both being great defenders that can, you know, switch reasonably from like one to four and hold their own. I I think that the Knicks are looking at this, like this is going to be a really good combo for years to come. And that's certainly how I'm looking at it. If I'm picking from the current Knicks roster, you know what they're like shooting guard, small forward combo of the future would be. To me, it's definitely Grimes and RJ. Yeah, I don't think there's any question. I mean, I think it's as simple as like like we can we can talk fit all we want. I think Grimes is just flat out the better prospect, and and probably mm-hmm. I'm not probably he is the better player right now between him and Quickly. And I'm kind of stunned to be saying that, obviously, because I'm I've been I've been well aboard the the Emmanuel Quickly is is going to be a star train for a long time. Obviously, the last. 25 or so games now have been really, really discouraging for people who have that opinion and, and anyone who roots for the Knicks. Um, but Grimes has just been that good as well on the other side of things. And and I know we've we've talked about it quite a bit, but I'll, I'll continue to reiterate that I don't think we know the upper echelon of who Quentin Grimes can be. And that, that wasn't really the story with him when he was drafted, right? Like his whole appeal was that you have this defined 3 and D guy. Now it's sort of like every every single night, what else can this dude do? I mean, last night he was it was flying in for rebounds. It was I mean, again making plays off the dribble, continuing to make smart passes. Um, his hands are just almost like magnets defensively. Like it feels like anytime someone tries to drive on him, he's he's stripping them or at least getting a good attempt on the basketball. Um, if I'm shocked when he doesn't make an open or semi open three ball at this point, like he he's just sort of becoming that dude. And and to your point, I mean, him and RJ feel like again you get. Like, however, however it has to happen for the Knicks, they find their centerpiece, like whether it's a point guard or, or a big or, or like a really athletic four or even like a third wing to play with those guys sort of Clipper style. Like they feel like the perfect complements to like one of the great alpha dog wings in the NBA, like a Luka Doncic, a LeBron James. Those guys don't grow on trees. They're very, very hard to get. But if the Knicks are ever fortunate enough to, uh, I think that is a perfect combo. Uh, there was another part of Ignacio's question that uh, relates to a second question we got. Um, he wanted to know what our ideal rotation would look like uh, if slash when Johnny Bryant takes over. Um, the way I'm looking at that is just sort of what our ideal rotation would look like under a new coach. I mean, I don't know anything about Johnny Bryant's uh, specific inclinations. And we got another question from Dead at Work at the Kev Snow wanting to know, let's say you take over the head coaching job for tips today. What does your rotation look like going forward? And what slash who are you asking the front office to get you um, in the draft slash this off season, uh, Alex, I'll, I'll throw that your way to, to introduce the topic. Yeah. So, I mean, looking at rotation, um, I, so yeah, I agree with the, the Johnny Bryant part. I mean, I don't know enough about Johnny Bryant, the coach to know like what his rotation would look like. I would assume he would probably want to run, which has been working for the Knicks lately. Like when the Knicks are working lately, they run with Julius Randall, which by the way, like I got to say, if Julius Randle continues playing the way that he has lately, like that's, he can reasonably be that guy that you were talking about just a moment ago. Like that if you have him and RJ and Grimes all sort of playing at the top level that they can play at, like that's a really nasty two to two to four combo. And I guess that's where my rotation starts, right? Like, so obviously Kemba Walker gone. Um, you know, should have been gone at the trade deadline one way or another, but I would assume that the Knicks are probably waiting until this off season if they're going to like buy him out or ship him out with a second attached or whatever, just because he'll be an expiring contract at that point. Um, Evan Fournier, I like, but I'm becoming less enchanted with as a long-term piece simply because Grimes is so good and so ahead of schedule that I'm kind of just ready to say, why don't the Knicks spend that money elsewhere? Like a Jalen Brunson. Um, rather than Fournier and use that, you know, money to, to shoot him out of town too. I actually, you know, as much as I wanted to trade Burks at the deadline, I don't hate the idea of keeping him around long-term as long as he's not being relied on quite as heavily as he is right now, uh, which is, you know, the obvious caveat of like, this is a coach other than, than Tibbs that's going to be doing this. So, you know, that's, uh, that'll lead us down that path. Um, I, I think, if I was going to make an ideal starting five, 
it would be Brunson. And that sort of answers the, the part of uh, Kev Snow's question there. Um, it, it, although of course he said, you know, or he says you're taking the head, head coaching job from Tibbs uh, in all scenarios, Tibbs is gone. Um, but I, I would prioritize getting a guy like Brunson who, as long as you're sticking with RJ and Randall as your as you're starting like core pieces, I think Brunson is a perfect fit because he, as we learned when we talked with Lauren Gunn about this, he's, uh, you know, the quintessential like do it all guy that can, um, you know, make some plays himself uh, can, you know, set the table for his teammates, but also can play off the ball and can do whatever you need him to do in that capacity. And, and he feels comfortable doing whatever, uh, which he's learned how to play so well off Luka Doncic, like, then playing with RJ Barrett and Julius Randle should come as second nature, you know, because they're even less uh, ball dominant than a Doncic, but maybe between the two of them roughly equal, like one Luca, as far as like usage and an amount that they're going to be setting up the offense, which then gives Brunson some opportunities to still do it. But it's not like with Kemba Walker where like, unless he's setting high pick and rolls and, and that sort of thing, he's not really doing so much on offense. You should get a lot more activity out of Brunson. Um, I would then, you know, I'd start Grimes, start RJ, start Randall, and I would re-up Mitchell Robinson. You know, I don't, I really don't think that you need to look that far to turn this team respectable pretty quickly. I I think that we've seen flashes of it. We even saw it in this Portland game where they look good and they just couldn't finish anything, you know, because they, it's partly coaching. It's partly the bad rotations. And it's partly just that a lot of these players on this team just don't quite fit. And, And, the guys that don't quite fit are soaking up a lot of minutes. And in some cases like Burks are being put into roles that they shouldn't be in. Um, I don't want to go too long without throwing it to you, Gavin. So I'll hold off how I would handle like the bench minutes and stuff. But I think that's my starting five with that grouping. Well, Alex, uh, I hate to break it to you, but I'm, I'm going to throw it right back to you because ultimately this rotation doesn't matter if the guys on the team aren't eating properly. Is there, is there any, any suggestion that you could add to, to the players' diets to ensure that uh, the Knicks are just maybe, maybe a little bit stronger, a little bit healthier? Yeah, I, I suppose uh, we could potentially recommend some built bars to the players if they need a good off-season regimen, because we are, of course, talking uh, about the off-season already, because it's starting to get to that time. And this is the time of year that I've pretty much given up on my New Year's resolutions, but not this year. I'm going to stick to my resolution to eat right thanks to built Bar. It almost feels like it's not really a resolution because I actually enjoy eating them. And have you tried the Puffs? If you haven't, you're really missing out on some of the best tasting bars that Built Bar has to offer. Puffs is the first ever protein infused marshmallow. They're fluffy, they're marshmallowy. They're not just a protein bar, they are a treat. And they're covered in 100% real chocolate. And in fact, all Built Bars are covered in 100% real chocolate, including the Puffs 100% real chocolate. That's why it makes it so easy to stick to your resolution. You can go to built.com and scroll down to the macros chart. You'll be blown away by the high protein and low calories combined with high fiber and low carbs. Most built bars contain 130 calories, four grams of sugar, and four grams of net carbs, which is industry leading, quite frankly. And they have a whopping 17 grams of protein. So much flavor compared to so little in the way of calories and the bad stuff is just a fantastic mix when you're talking about trying to trying to eat healthy and trying to replenish yourself after a workout. So go to built.com and use promo code LOCKED15 and you will get 15% off your order. Again, use promo code LOCKED15 for 15% off at built.com. All right, Gavin. So now I will throw it back to you. Uh, what, what do you think about restructuring the rotation here uh, as, it, as it pertains to, you know, going into the rest of the season and then in the off season and beyond? Yeah, uh, it's it's a, it's a fantastic question. All right, so I just I did uh, kind of what we did in the earlier episode this year and just wrote out my ideal minutes allotment. That time we, we both went all in. It was very convoluted. This time I tried to keep it a little bit simpler. So my rotation would would basically look like this. Um, I'm assuming full health for everyone. So I, I have Derek Rose coming back, and I think I'd keep Rose to 24 minutes per game because I, I just don't think there's any point in overstraining him at this point in his uh, his basketball life. Um, when there's nothing really left to play for this season is like, I, I saw a lot of people make this point on Twitter. I think Tom Piccolo did specifically, and I very much agree with this. I think the primary utility of Rose, at least for this season's team, when any aspirations of winning anything significant have sort of gone out the window it is to facilitate the development of Emmanuel quickly and Obi Toppin. And for both those guys, uh, IQ in particular, they've obviously fallen off in, in such a significant way. Like, I mean, I remember like the, the talk of the early season when Rose was healthy was wow. Obi's 
uh, Obi's plus minus is just out of this world. And we're realizing a little bit of that was, I mean, a lot of that was Julius Randle being terrible, but a bit of that was the Derrick Rose effect quickly has completely fallen off without Rose making his life a lot easier. I think that'll be a big boon for him. Um, so I have Rose at 24 minutes at the point guard spot. I also have Emmanuel quickly for 24 minutes at the point guard spot. And again, this is a rough draft in, in this scenario. Those two wouldn't really be getting any time together, but I'm assuming uh, either us as head coach or uh, Johnny Bryant would sort that out. Um, shooting guard Fournier at 28 Grimes at 20, but here's the key with that. I also have Grimes playing 12 minutes a game at the small forward with RJ Barrett playing 36 minutes per game at the small forward. Randall at 30 minutes at power forward, Obi at 18 minutes at power forward, Mitchell Robinson at 30 minutes, and then some combination of Jericho Sims, Taj Gibson, and Obi Toppin playing the remaining 18 minutes at center. Um, my, my priority would be obviously playing the young guys, getting Kemba out of the rotation uh, while still um, staying pretty competitive. And and I think I think you're kind of like satiating Tibbs and playing the best guys. I realized I totally forgot about Alec Burke. So maybe, maybe give him a little bit of – of Evan Fournier's minutes, but I, I'm kind of okay with that. Like, I, I think honestly, like only one of Burks or Fournier really needs to play. Like not, not in the sense that like they're not deserving or anything, but just like, again, like what are, what are you, what are you doing at this point with those two guys out there? And Fournier is the one of the two that the Knicks have more of an investment in. Yeah. And I think the big thing too, is just, you need to, I mean, the, the cruel irony of this whole thing, right. Is yeah. that we say, prioritize the youth, you know, stop prioritizing the wins, you know, and playing the vets. But like the reality is the vets are losing, you know? Yeah. So it's like, I don't really care. You know, at this point, I feel like if I'm the front office and I still have Tibbs in place, you have to just go to him at this point and be like, look, dude, like, I don't care what you think gives the team the best chance to win. The fact of the matter is we have like numbers here. Like you claim to be more analytically uh, inclined now, right? Like, we have numbers here that say that the younger guys, regardless of what you think you're seeing on the court are helping this team play better. You know? So like, even though Emmanuel quickly isn't shooting well, the team is performing better with him out there because he gives them uh, more of what's needed at that moment, regardless if the shots are going in or not compared to a Kemba Walker, who's like literally useless on defense, but maybe does more of what you like on offense in an ideal world. And it's just like, you know, I don't, I don't understand that. This whole thing, the rest of the season should just be about play the youth, see what you have in these guys. And if you win some games along the way, that's not bad, you know, but like if you lose some games along the way too, that's also not bad. Like winning and losing is not the end all be all or even a part of the equation at this point. You know, at this point, you're you're back to seven games under 500. You're like, you know, down the home stretch of the season. The East looks way too good for you to do anything this year. So like just call it quits as far as the wins thing. And if the wins come, don't, you know, obviously don't tank, don't process it, you know, and, and intentionally be throwing games or anything, but my God, I mean, I don't know how you can look at like a game like yesterday's and say, yeah, okay, this was totally worth it to give like Alec Burks big minutes down the stretch and have like Alec Burks and Taj Gibson high pick and rolls be like our, our bread and butter down the stretch of the game and having Alec Burks just like, throw the ball off the off the backboard on the inside because he doesn't know how to finish a layup like oh yeah this is definitely what we want to be doing you know with our late game offense this is the best way to like try to stop the bleeding in a game that we're bleeding in and also the best thing for all of our young players that need developing like let's just throw the veterans out here and let them like crap all over the floor um so the rest of my rotation you know would be kind of similar to what you were saying i would have a hard time finding minutes for burks this year I've, I've said all year, like, he's a luxury. You know, he's a guy that you have on your team if you're good and want that, like, wing scoring and whatever off the bench. But there's no developing him at this point. Like, he is who he is as a player, so there's no point in really – like, give him some time off, you know? Everybody loves a little, a little paid time off, right? Like, give him a little bit of time off, you know, and just say, look, man, like, we really need to play Grimes. We need to play quickly. We need to play – you know, Deuce McBride a little bit, you know, like find some minutes for these guys that need minutes, you know, to develop. And if Burks complains about that and says, Oh, well, I don't, I'm not down with that. Then you say, okay, well, we'll find you a new home in the off season. Cause you know, you're just, you're a luxury right now. Like we don't need to play you minutes. And the same thing goes for Kemba Walker, where it's like, I can't believe it's taken this long for Tibbs to bench him again when he was so eager to do it the first time. And I almost wonder if he's just at this point, like, looking at like the potential public perception and being like, oh, I don't feel like dealing with talking to Berman about why I 
why I, you know, bench Kemba again, but the, the enforcer as tips referred to him recently, the enforcer, right? The, the, uh, the, um, what did he say? The, uh, the, the guy swirling around the team, right? The, the trouble swirling around the team, Mark Berman, but like, you know, at this point, just bench Kemba again. Like, what's the point of him playing at this point? There is none. And so that's just kind of where I'm at with this. Like, I don't, it, you know, you you went to the trouble of writing down all the minutes. I didn't. But, like, it, it basically boils down to the same thing. You know, play some young players. Experiment some. I, I want Obi Toppin at the five a little bit. Like, just try it. Just try it. See, Throw it at the wall and see if it sticks. And give them, like, prior. You know, they have, like, I, uh, uh, Jeff Rasmussen for – for Strickland wrote this in his recap today, but like the Obi and Randall combo still only has like over the course of this whole season, like 93 minutes of action together. And I think like easily like 40 or 50 of those came in the first like seven games of the season yeah. and go figure. Those are some of the best Knicks games out there. And that combo helped them come back and win a few games. But like Tibbs has just since then decided that can never happen again. Make it a priority over these last, like whatever, like, 25 30 games get another 250 minutes out of that combo or something like put them in for like like seven eight minutes a game together and just see what happens just throw something at the wall and see what sticks i'm just i'm so tired of watching the same guys play every night in the, and having the games go almost exactly the same every single time except for the aberration one in every 10 games when all the vets light it up and the knicks win like they did at golden state the other day it's just I, I'm ready to just like lean into the fact that okay, this is a development year. Call this a development year the rest of the way out, and and treat it like one instead of uh, instead of trying to chase this fake winning dragon that you're going after here. Yeah, it's not a real dragon. There are no dragons. No. Um, <laughs> yeah, um, I want to I want to answer the uh, free agency aspect of that question and then get to one more question and then uh we have to talk about the game just a little bit um but first i wanted to tell everyone about bet online football might be over for the season after oh i guess yeah when you yeah super bowl will be over but basketball is in full steam for both pro and college hoops for all the latest odds totals player performance props to where the next fired coach is going to land betonline.net is the number one spot for all your sports betting needs BetOnline remains the best spot for all your sports scores, podcasts, and news this season. And it's not just basketball. BetOnline.net is your source for hockey, boxing, and UFC odds right to the Olympic coverage and information that you desire. So head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends and action. BetOnline, where the game starts. All right. um, Very quickly, Alex, I want to touch on the free agency aspect of this question. Um, So I don't think the Knicks are going to be going big game hunting this summer because there just there isn't a lot of big game to be had. Right. Bradley Beal, uh, all reports are he's going to go back to Washington. Zach Levine, I cannot imagine he will leave Chicago with how well things are going there. Uh, Kyrie Irving, I'm not sure if we want to touch that one with with the with a million foot. I was going to say pole, but I'll say vaccinated needle. Um, And I don't I don't think he wants to leave uh, Brooklyn either way. Would be funny if he did, but I would be surprised if he did. would be that would be insane if he was a Nick, but that's that's a podcast for another day. Uh, Jalen Brunson uh, is the obvious target for New York, so let's let's pencil him in and assume that that works out. And then just running through it, the other guys like I kind of noted quickly that would be a little intriguing for me. Uh, we've talked about Mo Bamba recently at the center spot. Wouldn't mind someone like that. Uh, Chris Boucher also like has some stretch five in him though he's only shooting twenty eight percent from three this year. So that one is maybe a little bit of a tougher sell. Um, And then Kyle Anderson was a name that I liked quite a bit. Um, Just sort of like a point forward off the bench. I think if you were signing him on top of Silent Brunson, that would mean you somehow got off of like a whole lot of money, like Fournier, Burks, maybe more. Um, So that's maybe a pipe dream. And then the pipe dream of all pipe dreams is, of course, DeAndre Ayton, who uh, would be a significant upgrade over Mitchell Robinson as well as Mitchell Robinson has been playing. Um, that would take the Suns really, really blowing it and some mutual interest on Aiton's part. But something I think as the season goes on, we have to continue to discuss because there was recently a, um, I don't know if Zach Lowe, he he wrote about in his column. I don't know if he was framing it as a report or or more speculative, but I think it was based on some reporting that Phoenix had loosely had conversations with Indiana about an Aiton for DeMontis Sabonis talk, uh, presuming that there's, there's some, uh, lack of interest or, or lack of uh, cognizance that they could resign Aiden uh, from Phoenix. So something to keep in the back of your mind. If the Knicks, I mean, you were talking about the dream two through four, 
in, in, in our perfect world, if the Knicks were able to sign Jalen Brunson and DeAndre Ayton, you had a lineup going forward of Brunson, Grimes, RJ, Randall, and Ayton, that would look pretty amazing, but would require some massive cap gymnastics from the Knicks and interest from those two players. I actually don't think it would be that crazy to make that happen if um, – essentially you could make that happen. I think this off season, if you don't sign Mitch to an extension prior to the end of the year and like, look, let's not pretend the tampering doesn't exist in the NBA. Like if Deandre Ayton wants to come to the Knicks, they probably have some sort of, you know, idea of that at this point, or they, you know, Leon Rose has at least been in touch with his, his agent and been like, Hey, what do you think the chances are like this yes. coming off season, you know, or, or used one of his, you know, agent contacts at CAA to, you know, reach out on his behalf to, you know, whoever and, and just be like, hey, you think there's a chance Aiton would want to come here in the summer? Because then he could start already sort of backdoor talking to Phoenix about like, hey, Aiton kind of wants to come here. He's kind of over you guys because you didn't offer him an extension and he felt like he was worth one. And, you know, it doesn't seem like you guys want to pay him, you know, the the amount that he wants. We're willing to pay him that amount. If we could talk to Mitchell Robinson and his representation would you guys want to work out a double sign and trade where we sign and trade you Mitch for Aiton? Mitch ends up making less money. And we also shoot you over like an Alec Burks to make the salaries match and also give you guys more bench scoring, you know, on a, a team that will have finals aspirations again, because quite frankly, you know, if they still have Chris Paul, Devin Booker, uh, Macau bridges, you know, all their core in place and then just swap Aiton for Mitch. I, I don't think that's going to change too much. As far as their title aspirations, I think they could still very well be a title team with how Mitch has been playing. And then the Knicks get, you know, an upgrade at the center spot, but one that they have to pay a premium for and be prepared to absorb the probably like 20 plus million dollar cap hit for, you know, a number of years. I think Aiden probably wants more like like 30 million dollars, uh, like it's close to like a or maybe his rookie max, which is probably like 28 million or something like that, because um, he's never made any all NBA teams or whatever. So. You know, it's it, it'll it'll be interesting to see how that all plays out. That could be a target for them, though, because they can pull that off after going after a Brunson because Mitch's cap hold is so small that then they can say, OK, we're going to do all this business first with Brunson, get him signed, you know, ship out Fournier for a pick or whatever, you know, send a pick out with Fournier and then sign Brunson and then say, OK, now time to execute that Mitch for eight and swap, get that done. And then, boom, you just like completely reshaped your roster in a little small amount of time, although not fully reshaping it in the sense that you keep at least some of those core guys there. That's certainly intriguing to me. Um, I, I would love to look at that. And then as far as the draft, which this sort of leads into, we got another question. We actually had two more questions. We had one more come in as we were recording here. Um, yeah. But Spanish Harlem alum had uh, at Paul B. Diaz asked us Ty Ty Washington or JD Davison. Uh, my answer right now is I haven't really watched Davison enough to make a, uh, a a call on that. Uh, so as of right now, I have done a little looking into Ty Ty Washington and I like him a lot. Uh, I think he's, you know, from what I've seen, I'm not going to say that he's like, like quickly or whatever, but he's got that Kentucky guard uh, <laughs> status about him where he kind of like feels like there's more under the surface to me. And that's what most of like the people that have been reading writing about him have have said you know is that like is he going to be the latest case of a Kentucky guard that you know shows way more in the NBA than he showed in college and the answer is like probably yes um just based off what his skill set looks like so far so I'm in on him uh I think that in the draft you know if that's my free agent class and you wind up parting with say like a Burks to make this Mitch for eight and swap work I would probably want to prioritize a a guard in the draft. So if it's Ty Ty Washington, um, if it's like Johnny Davis, depending on where the Knicks end up, like Johnny Davis is a guy that I've seen and I've been pretty intrigued by. I think Jaden Ivey is my ideal, like perfect fit that if the Knicks could somehow make that happen, then like, yeah, you freaking do it. Cause that would be awesome. Um, I also like AJ Griffin uh, who sort of, is a little bit redundant in the sense that he would be like, he's pretty big. I mean, he, I, from what I could tell, he probably profiles as like a three, four, but in the NBA with his size and his, you know, his, his like kind of relative slowness, he would probably be a four. Uh, so maybe he ends up just your latest addition to the, the log jam there. But I think the talent 
is really there and he's looking like a really good three point shooter and stuff. So yeah. he's a guy that I'm looking at, but before we get to the, the final like mailbag thing here, Gavin, what's uh do you have any other thoughts on, on the draft there? I barely watch college basketball this year, so I have no draft thoughts. I'm, but we I'm will. the same way. I, this is all is this should all come with a disclaimer that like this is all coming with like just like reading mock drafts and watching like a small amount of highlights on YouTube so far. <laughs> like I'm not there yet. But yeah, we'll I don't even get there that. soon. I might not even be as far along as you are. So I will I will leave it to a draft expert that I'm sure we will have on in the near future, given the way that the <laughs> next season is going. Uh, but yeah, final question I thought was a really good one. It came from Ian Clark at Clark underscore Ian. He said, "What's one aspect of Obi Toppin's game?" that he has to improve slash change for him to become a realistic starter. Will he ever get enough minutes to have the breakout game that he needs? Um, I think we, this is something we've discussed a little bit on the pod before, but I think it's, it's pretty obvious to me. Um, he needs to either improve massively as a shooter or as a ball handler, right? Like, like I think those things are, are non-negotiable right now. He's, he's so much better offensively than he was a year ago. And he does have the ability to grab and go and like attack into like a little post up. I mean, depending on how much confidence he has on a game to game basis and depending how much time he gets to work and try and figure something out on a game to game basis, um, the, having a shot would allow him to do that with great frequency, right? Because then you, you get those hard closeouts to him and he can pump, take one dribble, get to the rim, dance around a center and, and or, or dunk on his face. Um, or if his handle gets better, then you don't need a three point shot as much. And he can just kind of like do is like, we, we had that one move where we compared him to Giannis. He can do like a mini Giannis thing where he just sort of bulldozes into people. And we've seen what kind of touch he has the rim. Obviously we know the hops he has around the rim. Uh, so that's, that's where I'm at on Obi Toppin. Yeah, I, I'm sort of with you too. I think the shooting and the ball handling need to need to improve, or maybe the ball handling. I mean, that's like that's like a stretch goal, you know. Like that would be great if if it did improve, but if it doesn't, it's not. I mean, he's still a fine player, and I think that even where his ball handling is now, he has the ability to go from the perimeter, credibly, you know, put the ball on the floor and get to the inside and finish a dunk or whatever. I mean, that's that's pretty much as good as you could ask for. Uh, you know, I guess the improvements would be like being able to get out in transition and kind of like like run the break sort of like how Randall does um but I don't think Obi necessarily needs to turn into a Randall clone as far as having that level of ball handling that said you know in the spirit of the question what does he need to do to become a realistic starter I mean that's just <laughs> he needs to be on a team without Julius Randall in front of him you know I think is is the answer there and you know we found ourselves sort of envisioning that world at one point prior to the trade deadline, but now with Randall playing how he is again, I I don't think I'm ready to just sort of like ship Randall out just to ship him out at this point. You know, I have to really get knocked on my butt to send him away again now, you know, which is a, a testament to how good he's been playing lately. And if he continues to play that way all through the rest of the season, it seems like he's finally gotten comfortable and gotten over whatever was on his mind earlier in the season that was affecting his play, then I, I'm comfortable keeping Randall you know, for the foreseeable future, because he's playing right now, like honestly a more refined version of last year. Cause we've noted it that like, he's getting to the rim more now and getting to the free throw line and stuff more so than having his game purely be based on jump shooting, uh, which I think is a lot better for his long-term prospects of, you know, having sustained success where he doesn't have to be shooting like 50% for mid range and stuff to be an effective player. Um, so I don't think there's a path for Obi to be a starter on this team, if we're being completely honest. Again, as long as Randall is on the team, I don't, I don't think Obi's going to get there. Um, for him to get a more significant role and have more minutes, like let's say like instead of saying starter, let's say like what's Obi's path to 24 minutes a night or something or, you know, 30, heaven forbid. Like the answer to that question is just a coach that takes more chances. And so Tibbs getting fired and someone – coming in that's willing to play him 10 minutes at the center uh that's the answer to getting him more minutes it unfortunately a lot of it's out of his control um and and as far as the answer of if he's going to ever get enough minutes to have that breakout game he needs the answer is probably no unless Tibbs takes his you know takes his mind off of his like platonic ideal of what a center should be and you know is willing to experiment a little bit this year. He's never going to find the minutes because Randall still exists and Randall's still going to be eating up 35 to 40 minutes a game. So, yeah. 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 It's a sad reality, but it's, it's a real one right now for Obi Toppin. Uh, mm -hmm. Let's, I can't believe we've gone 35 minutes and haven't talked about the game. So let's, let's spend just five minutes, some quick thoughts on this one. Um, the themes for me uh, from this loss outside of obviously just the, 
the torture <laughs> that it was to watch the comeback. Uh, I think the Knicks really, really missed RJ Barrett. Like it was just pretty, there was just so much stagnation on offense late in this game. And it was pretty obvious that they just couldn't get any rim pressure at all. And like when they were rolling in the third quarter, it was because Grimes made four threes in the third quarter. And that was, that was pretty much it. And uh, the other big deal was that uh, Mitchell Robinson went out with an ankle injury about halfway through the third. And from that point forward, Yusuf Nurkic, even though he didn't score a whole lot, I think he really controlled the game with both his offensive rebounding and his screening. And he was able to, I mean, part of it was just poor perimeter defense, but Anthony Simons got th- free for a bunch of big triples, uh, both off of screens where Taj didn't get up high enough or where Nurkic was uh, posting up Taj. And then someone like Evan Fournier, like way, way, way over help. And they probably should just let Nurkic try to score in the post and he would kick out and Simons would hit a big three. So I, I think those were the big issues for the Knicks down the stretch. Alex, if you want to go in a more positive direction, uh, Quentin Grimes was was pretty amazing in this one. Yeah, yeah. Grimes was fantastic. I mean, I thought Grimes, Randall, and even Kemba Walker, I mean, as much as I was just moaning about how I don't think the vets should be playing, I thought this was one of Kemba's better games of the year. But Grimes, I mean, he was unstoppable. He was completely unconscious in the third quarter. Uh, I think he hit four or five I think he had four triples just in the third quarter and had one other uh, earlier in the game and like 20 points, four boards, three assists, two steals, six, 10 shooting five, eight from three. And everything is just so fluid with him. You know, it's, I, I don't know how much more we could say about how like gorgeous his jump shot is, but like, it, it's the truth. I mean, he just, it, I think that Wally, I, I got to give Wally props. He's, he's been quite a bit better on the, on the call this year, but uh he mentioned, you know, like as a shooter, you want to be, you want to ideally like jump up and land from the same spot and, you know, have that straight up and down perfect jumper. And like Grimes just always has that unless he builds in a designed fade or, you know, sidestep or whatever into his jumper, in which case it still seems to always go in how he wants it to when he's really cooking. Um, I think he's just got such a bright future as a, as a scorer in the NBA, but what was even more what stood out even more than the shooting which is what we always get into with him in this game was the uh the hustle plays i mean just the the intangible stuff that in at some points this game became tangible like you know when the knicks uh missed a bucket uh earlier in the game and this was i think before they went on the big run in the third quarter like when when they were in the second quarter and things were still kind of you know back and forth and you know, there's an offensive rebound that looks like Grimes has no business getting to. He just like skies in and just snatches yeah. it and it came out of like nowhere. I don't know how he managed to get his hands on it. Then goes up for just this gorgeous, like double pump uh, layup and, you know, puts it in. I was just like, dude, that's like, that's crazy hustle right there. And, and it was very endearing. I mean, this was just, this is one of those games. I mean, it's literally why we opened the show talking about like, Oh, RJ and Grimes is like the no brainer wing duo for this team going forward. If, you know, if they want to prioritize the younger players and like, like wait, you know, be willing to be patient through the growing pains that Grimes still has as minimal as they are. I I think there's a really great NBA player really starting to rear his head here with Grimes. And I think the Knicks have really found themselves like an even bigger steal than Emmanuel quickly was last year at the 25th pick, which is really saying something. Yeah, I mean, just the, I mean, I guess that's what I was hinting at earlier in the episode, just like the physicality around the rim and on, on both. I mean, he had, a, he had a stretch in this play where he literally got steals on, on two straight plays. Like he, he just, he changes the course of games at this point. That's not, that's not how you describe a three and D guy, right? Like, like they're not usually momentum swingers. Like that's how you describe a, a star. And I'm obviously he's not there yet, but we're seeing there, there are little moments that again, just, just kind of make you think. Uh, speaking of which I felt the same way about Cam Reddish, who, did not statistically have a really good game, right? 14 points, one of three from the field, four of four from the free throw line. But for the second game in a row, I just, I sort of felt like he did some really good things. Like he had one play where he missed a layup, but he just had a nasty blow by, got all the way to the rim. And then Randall was right there to clean it up. Um, and then he had, he had another really nice one where he play faked, like almost like he was, he was running back on defense. And then the last second pivoted around, got a steal, uh, went coast to coast for the layup. Like I'm seeing... I, I hope he plays more time. Like the fact, again, I, obviously we're just harping on this and Cam Reddish was another guy I forgot in my, in my fake dream rotation. Sorry, Cam, you should, he should be in there. Uh, maybe instead of Evan Fournier, um, he, he got 14 minutes in this game. Alec Burks got 21 Fournier who shot one for 13, got 30 and played pretty awful defense, got 36 minutes in this game. Like 
I guess I guess this is coming full circle for me. That's my final note. What are, what are we doing, guys? What are we doing? Well, Cam, to be fair, did twist his ankle. So oh, we did. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, then I take back. I apologies. Apologies yeah. to Tibbs. Yeah. Hey, hey, Tibbs, stop throwing. Yeah. Stop wanting to throw Cam out there for all these minutes when he's hurt. Okay. Yeah. Like that you know, was actually play, play him injured. Play him injured. It's about the development, <laughs> but he has to learn how to play hurt. That was like one of the most. I, I'll end this with this note. Like that was one of the most egregious things to me was that Mitch twisted his ankle at one point and was like literally limping up and down the court and Tibbs left him in for another like five minutes to the point where it got to the end and Mitch looked like he was about to die. And then they took him out and go figure he got treatment and was like, Oh yeah, he's ruled out for the rest of the game. And it's like, it's almost like Tibbs sometimes sees someone get hurt. And then it's like, Oh, well I know he's going to get pulled the second I get him out of here. So may as well milk as many minutes as I can, instead of like calling it mercy timeout to get my guy out of the game right now. Yeah, when he, when he should be free. saying ice, ice, ice. Yeah, yeah, he should be icing his ankle on the court. Uh, anyway, yeah, I think that's it for this episode of Locked On. Next, we've gone kind of long, so um, <laughs> thank you all for listening. Uh, we'll be back with some more game recaps this week. Maybe we'll start getting into draft stuff soon because it's feeling like it's about that time. But we got some other good episodes coming for you guys this week too. Thank you all for listening, and we will talk to you guys all soon. Peace out.